I er, may have killed more people than I actually avenged here. <laughs> so whenever I got that, and there's more, but uh, when I actually clicked on that one, I got a, uh, a trophy or an award, and it was uh, uh, Ludo uh, Narrative uh, Dissonance. Nice. <laughs> this week on Backward Compatible, Jim, Doc, and Chris are joined by Nick Kruger for a roundtable discussion on Gunpoint. Plus, impressions of Telltale's Batman and a fan-made remake of Metroid 2. Backwardcompatible.com podcast starts right now. Hello, Backward Compatible listeners, and welcome to episode number 73 of the Backward-Compatible.com podcast, games and new media with a splash of academia. As always, I'm Chris, and I'm joined today by Jim. Hey. And we're joined by Doc. Hey, everybody. And we're joined today, once again, by my brother, Nick. Hello. Um... Are we gonna are we gonna keep calling it like featuring Nick Kruger? Is he kind of enough of a part of the crew that we need to announce it every time? I Dude, he's, he's BC family, man. Yeah, <laughs> he, he does the music. He's been on multiple times, so but, so technically he's been on every single episode, whether people knew it or not. Yeah, oh, good maybe. point. Yeah, That's true. <laughs> or at least his work. Wait, so BC family does that? Does that mean like Jim is my brother or something like that? Uh, no, but uh, you might want to claim like uh, Chris is your brother. Oh well, yeah. Yeah, because that's a good, that's a good point. I don't know. Jim is more like the creepy <laughs> uncle, actually. <laughs> yeah, I'm like the I'm like the creepy old guy that lives under the bridge. Uh huh. Yeah. Troll. The, 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 that's what I was getting at. <laughs> <laughs> the Sinor card gauge is sort of like mysteriously popping up from behind bushes. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Hello there, Belinda. <laughs> Um, but today's media discussion is going to be on Gunpoint. It's our roundtable discussion, and actually in a backward compatible first, uh, we've got um, someone besides the main crew joining us for our roundtable. That's something we might do in the future if we have someone who has played a game and has interesting stuff to play about it, have them join us for those discussions. So based on that statement, you're not crew. <laughs> oh, yeah. So family, but not crew. Family, but not crew. Or something. This, like that. this works. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but before we get to that, we've got some opening segments for you, including the button mosh. For the butt mosh, where the crew jumps in on the video games they've been rocking lately. So last week we mentioned that Telltale's Batman was coming out, and it is now out. And uh, the first episode was pretty good. Um, I wasn't blown away by it, um, but I'm very intrigued with where it's going. Um, I did like that. Uh, you know, we discussed one of the things that we're attracted to in this one is that it's both being Batman and being Bruce Wayne. Um, and actually, you might spend technically a little bit more time as Bruce Wayne than as Batman in this one. Um, I found that uh, I generally liked um, being Bruce Wayne better. Um, it felt more like you're making meaningful choices about your your lifestyle and how you're perceived. You don't have to be kind of the uh, you know the the playboy a hole Bruce Wayne if you don't want to be. Um, so they give you some flexibility there. Do, is is there a scene where you're at a party and you have to kick people out because um, for their own good, but you get to just call them all out? So the first episode's available for free. I'm pretty sure you can download the game, play the first episode, and then decide if you want to buy the season pass. I like how he didn't um, answer your question. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to it. Oh, well. I'm, I'm insulted. So I'm going to give a few spoilers here and there. Nothing too crazy, but um, well, it's episode one. It's episode so, one, yeah. and you can go get it for free and play it yourself. I'm curious about it, too, mm-hmm. as, as a Batman. Yeah, I think you would like it. Um, but what ends up happening is you are throwing a party, and it's a fundraiser for Harvey Dent's um, mayor campaign. Campaign for mayor. Let me ask you this. Oh, I yes. played that arc. <laughs> so, um, what look did they go for with Harvey Dent? Um, kind of buff, uh, very like big, square jaw. And is he a white guy or a black guy? White guy. See, I ask because in the comics he's a white guy, but then in Batman the um, eighty nine film he was played by Lando Calrissian. Right. Oh, interesting. And oh, I, didn't know I don't know if y'all remember that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, his name. Yeah, actually Billy D. Williams, but mm-hmm. he's uh, always Lando. He's, he's Lando always he's always Lando. Yeah, but he never made it to Two Face, did he? No. Yeah. He I, was just Harvey because they didn't get that far with the you know with the um, uh, was a Tim Burton. They didn't yeah, get that far yeah. with Tim Burton's universe. <laughs> um, but I've they've done they've used that version in uh, in some other incarnations mm-hmm. sometimes like I want to say it was the Batman that did it wasn't it the Batman cartoon 
that was just literally called the Batman that used that version. Anyway, mm. I'm getting way off point here. Yeah, <laughs> you're asking as if I would know. I was just, <laughs> I was just curious because yeah. there's there's so many different incarnations of Batman right. that sometimes they'll use different. And I think that this particular Batman is kind of standalone, and I'll get to why I think that's the case in a minute. Mm. Um, but uh, Falcone actually shows up at that party at one point, and basically he was invited because um, he's never been convicted of any crimes or anything like that. So even though everyone basically knows he's a mob boss, right? Uh, right. Strictly speaking. He He's a legitimate businessman. Uh, so he's Very actually, much like a Lex Luthor type figure. Yeah. So, you know, this party's being hosted at the Wayne Manor, but Harvey Dent invites him uh, as a potential supporter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so basically you have to make this decision of with other people in the room sort of being aware of how you're interacting with them. Mm-hmm. You choose, like, for example, whether or not to shake his hand um, or, like, you know, when you go into the back room to have a private conversation with him, uh, like, do you invite Harvey in with you despite what he, because yeah, he doesn't want Harvey to join you? Hmm. Um, how do you interact? with them behind closed doors that sort of thing and and how is the heart like harvey is presented as he is just harvey dent the attorney he's currently he the da running from he doesn't have any hints of the two-faced persona not yet okay. except i'm just to, curious except to say that there are a few times when you wonder um if maybe he's setting you up in some ways okay um, that's interesting yeah you that's wonder if like maybe he's trying to distance himself from you but hmm. um at least when you're speaking to him in person, despite these, despite these uh, suspicions, he is definitely very much on your side and an honest guy and trying to help you out. But of course, he has the nickname Two Face even before he uh, became Two Face. So politically, uh, yeah. So interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Well, it's, it's, it was something they well, it's something they mentioned in um, the Dark Knight trilogy, at least. Hmm. Um, yeah, he asked some... like, you know, what did they always used to call me? Yeah, you know, behind my back. Um, and then when he said Two Face, then he turns his head and he's got like the the bird face. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so not to dwell on this too much. Um, when you are playing as Batman, there are some scenes where you're doing some sort of detective work. You look at a crime scene and you try to sort of link this little thing that you're observing with something else to make a uh, a, a quick little um, assumption about what might have happened. So it's not nearly as depth as the, as the Sherlock Holmes game that we talked about. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to ask about but that. But it's, it's got elements of that. Um, and then lots of action. Um, the action se- scenes tend to be um, fairly drawn out. You're doing a lot of like push up to attack or to dodge or to block so, and then press, you know, X to do an attack, that sort of thing. So how, how is the, cause I've heard, I've heard mixed things. I've heard mm-hmm. some people say that the action parts are like almost boring. It's, it's pretty standard telltale fare. Um, I don't know if I'd call it boring in as much as I'm used to it. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm used to this style of action. They have this one scene, for example, where you're trying to, um, plan a plan an attack on a, um, a mob boss's headquarters. And um, Falcone's actually, and you uh, sort of visualize. You ha- you take a drone. You're sort of from the, on the outside of the skyscraper, and so you're looking at these two levels in the skyscraper and planning how you're going to attack. Um, and so you observe. Okay, there's an armed guard here, an armed guard here, here, and here. Um, and then, okay, how am I going to deal with each of these? And using the same sort of mechanic of like linking this person to something in their surroundings, uh, the same way that you would link two clues together. Um, you can basically choose, okay, I'm going to ram this guy into a pillar. Uh, I'm going to ram this guy, you know, either into the table or into this folding screen, that sort of thing. And so you kind of get to choose like which of two things you do. And I'm wondering if they're going to open that up a little bit more, have it mean more. Um, Just so, lots of ramming. Yeah, lot, lots of ramming, <laughs> lots of that Raymond. That Raymond. Uh, <laughs> and, um, actually, one of the more interesting choices you get to make as Batman, um, so in addition to the sort of like how you're perceived as Bruce Wayne, there's also how you're perceived as Batman. And so, so um, this is a slight spoiler, but there's this one part where you've basically stopped Falcone and you're now in the public view. There's a helicopter there that's, mm. you know, every, they're seeing everything that's happening. And so you get to choose to either brutalize them or just arrest him. Um, and then you're going to leave him there for the police either way. But are you making a statement like Batman is someone to be feared who's going to destroy you, or is Batman someone who's more the knight in shining armor? Is, is, is that just a binary choice between those two, or do you have like the Batusi option? Like if you just start mm-hmm. dancing the Batusi over <laughs> yeah, no. In that case, it's just the two. <laughs> that's, the, um, that's the make the criminals think that you're completely insane. That would probably scare them even so more. So the Adam West option was removed from this game, is what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> now, um, the, one, the one thing that bugged me slightly is there's this one scene after an encounter where you're talking to uh, Alfred in the Batcave, and he's, um, he's basically scolding you for beating a man half to death to get information from him. When in the scene before, like you had the option to do that, 
but I didn't do that. And it even said that, like, you know, when uh, when um, the police show up, huh. they noted your nonviolent approach. Hmm. Like, I had that pop up on the screen. Yeah. And then I don't know if it was a bug or if they just didn't write it well enough. And arguably, you could say that the guy took a little bit of a beating in the sense that, like, you know, you slam him up against a wall to keep him from shooting you. And then, like, you sort of, like, hang him from the ceiling and stuff like that. But you don't have to. That's not half to death. Yeah, you, you don't have to torture him at all if you don't huh. want to. That's like a quarter to death. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and so, like, it, yeah, it's... it's it's a passable scene in that sense, but that was that was the one time in the episode I felt like I wasn't really paying attention to what I was doing. That's the moment where Batman goes, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bring me my tea, Alfred. How's the voice? Uh, who's who's playing him again? Uh, Troy Baker. Troy Baker. How's he doing as Batman? Uh, good, good. Um, it's not He's not doing anything like super you know, nuts as far as like changing his voice too much, although I did notice that uh, when he's saying something out loud to someone as Batman, he'll like, sort of like touch his throat and then like the voice modulator comes on, so it mm-hmm. makes it like deeper and more gravelly. Um, so so he, it's, it's sort of similar to what they did in Batman. So they, oh, just, they do the... Hands. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's not the... It's <laughs> 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 My face is <are> dead! <laughs> Yeah, see, that's what I, what I like so much about um, the Kevin Conroy <laughs> Batman from the animated series mm-hmm. was it was really more like his normal voice was kind of the Batman voice, and then mm-hmm. he did this sort of, like, higher-pitched, happier voice for Bruce Wayne mm-hmm. right. to kind of play off the Bruce version. Mm-hmm. And so my, so my final question is related to that, actually, and maybe this that's what this series wants to, to learn or, mm-hmm. or at least consider. Is, is he Bruce Wayne that is dressing up as Batman, or is he Batman that pretends to be Bruce Wayne when he's not out fighting crime? Mm. If you see what I'm getting at. Well, actually, that, that question they've, they've exactly... gone both ways in all sorts of Batman media. That, that question exactly so. is kind of explored in that first episode. Really? Um, and I, that's kind of the theme it, that it, it, Yeah, it it's, it's hard for me Batman. to give you a, a good answer, honestly, um, because I think it's open to interpretation either way. Okay. Well, if they wrote it right, it's open to player interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Meaning you, you make the decision. Mm-hmm. Cool. It, it, I think part of it, too, kind of comes down to how fake you're being in either one um because he even talks about for example uh like you know alfred is sort of cautioning you against becoming too violent as batman not going too far um and so you can either kind of like be like oh yeah i know you're right you know i'm not gonna i'm not gonna stray from the path or anything like that or you can kind of be like uh no i'm gonna do absolutely whatever's necessary um but then also when you're bruce wayne you know can you kind of be like the honest true to yourself bruce wayne or do you try to like sort of put on a facade um mm. Mm-hmm. So I guess either way, it kind of depends on what the player chooses. So you kind of get to choose two different approaches for two different characters yes. in a mm-hmm. sense, which I think is really cool. Yeah, yeah. I still say the all Alfred game would be great. Yeah, <laughs> the uh, what you say is Alfred influences Batman. Yeah, but and, I do and then between cool. scenes, you have to polish the furniture. <laughs> no, no, no. You, you sp- he's got to be spending most of his time trying to get blood out of Batman's costume. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's always someone else's blood. Too. <laughs> cool. But yeah, no. Um, definitely go check out the first episode, see if you like it, and if so. Uh, Get the season pass. Should have been called Tales of Batman. Well, I have a button wash as well, and, and actually I've been playing recently the Metroid 2 remake. Um, it's actually been known in the community as another Metroid 2 remake because Metroid 2, to give a little background on this, and the game just came out yesterday, but to give a little, uh, August 6th. Metroid 2 just came out yesterday? The remake. <laughs> the remake. Now, and, this, is, um, this is a fan-made so, remake. Yes, the fan-made remake. Jim, but this is, this is free, and it's fan-made. It is it, free. It's not a real video game. Yeah. No, no, no. no. <laughs> you didn't pay money for it to a, to Nintendo. It's not a real video game. It's actually, it's actually quite quite excellent, which I'll go into the specifics of the game act- in a few minutes, but I, I did want to give a little bit of background, because this game has actually been in development since 2008. I've been following the game since. What? Yes, I've been following the game, and I've been following the game since then. By the way, so I believe um, that. that's why winning <laughs> because I'm a huge Metroid fan. Yeah. I, I, I've been a huge Metroid fan growing up, and Metroid Two was always this game that I really wanted to like because I loved the concept. The concept of Metroid Two is you're sent to the home planet of the Metroids to destroy them. You're gonna wipe out. You're gonna basically you're you're going to commit genocide on the Metroid because they're just too dangerous. That's that's your job, and of course this leads into the storyline of Super Metroid, where the one baby Metroid you know survives, and they have that's a big central a central point of Super Metroid. But Metroid Two, because it was on Game Boy, because they had just the monochrome color palette, um, all the rooms ended up looking the same, so it was very very easy to get lost. Mm-hmm. It was um, a very confusing and frustrating game. A that's, lot of the boss actually, fights didn't uh, work very well. It's actually what spawned uh, Samus's signature giant shoulder pads. Is that they needed a way to distinguish if you got an upgrade, mm-hmm. so rather than changing the color because they couldn't on the Game Boy, they changed the silhouette. Yeah. Oh, sure. And then that's and there's a lot of things in that in Metroid Two that were like later carried over into other parts of the series. Um, it it does have a little bit more linearity in the sense that. 
um, part of the game, the gameplay is that you, since you're hunting down all the Metroids, you have like a counter for all the Metroids that you have to, um, to, to destroy. I think it starts at like 50. And um, every time you find a Metroid and kill it, the, the counter goes down one. Um, but also after you kill a certain number of Metroids within an area, more of the world sort of unlocks. Um, mm. It's like you keep going deeper and deeper into the planet because you have um, like there's like like lava or different hazards that like sort of impede your progress and as you destroy metroids the planet sort of changes a little bit and lets you go deeper and deeper into it um so i looked it up on his on his blog site as and which is you can find it by typing in if you type in another metroid 2 remake in google you'll find it um game is out you can download it um, but essentially what he wanted to do, and he even said this, he wanted to take some of the newer concepts from Metroid games, like from Zero Mission, and especially from Super Metroid, mm-hmm. and then incorporate those into Metroid 2 mm-hmm. um, to sort of take this game that had a really cool concept and cool idea and, and a different approach to Metroid, but still Metroid, but kind of failed because of technical limitations and actually make it a, a solid 2D Metroid game. Cool. And it succeeds at that. Um, yeah, because I feel like Metroid Two is kind of often overlooked. Yeah, and that's why because it's 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 a very confusing game. It is the the hardest one for someone, especially in today's generation, to go back and play. Um, even though the original Metroid has some of those elements where it's it's you can possibly get lost and there's not a lot of direction. Um, it was put together in such a way that you can still find where you're going. Metroid Two gets very confusing. Mm. Um, it's pretty significant in the storyline too. Yeah. So it is. Um, so yeah, so he's been working on this game since 2008 and essentially I, I believe he was originally using some sort of another engine, like a game maker type engine, but somewhere along the way, as he got more experienced, he scrapped all of that and kind of remade it and just made the whole, made the whole thing, programmed it himself, and just one person put it together. That's why it took so long for it to come out. Mm-hmm. And, also, and he was doing it for free, too. Yes, and he did the music for it and all this kind of stuff. So basically, he kind of turned into a perfectionist, and, and he could have released it much sooner, and it <laughs> oh, would have been a shoddier project, yeah. but he didn't want to. Mm-hmm. And so he just kept working on it. I've played some of the demos along the way, and, and the demos were already relatively polished mm-hmm. for like parts of the content. So you can tell, like... like you, the sprite work, all that kind of stuff that he that, that he put into it, that he all did himself, um, it has the feel of a Nintendo, Super Nintendo era game. So something I'm actually curious about, and you can probably answer this being a big fan of Metroid, mm. is how closely, like not just in terms of the look, because I saw some screenshots and it did look a lot like, um, you know, Super Metroid. Um, but would you say that the feel, um, like the way that like sort of things move on the screen and the way that you control them, does it feel like an actual Metroid? Because yeah. there's sometimes people make fan games where there's just something a bit off about it, if that makes sense. Where no. like they, they move in like, you know, at the wrong speed or something. They like forgot that. to program in slide. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. No, it, it definitely feels like Metroid. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that I, I would compare it most to is actually more like Zero Mission mm-hmm. or maybe Fusion mm-hmm. in terms of controls. Um, just because there are he does incorporate some additional um, style. Like I know you have the, the directional aims and the way that they're set up mm-hmm. is a little bit more like zero mission than super Metroid, but you can actually customize the controls a bit if you want to. Mm-hmm. So there's a little bit of extra that you can do. I don't recommend anybody plays this with a mouse and keyboard, even though it is a PC game. Mm-hmm. The first thing that comes up when you start the game, it says like, control, con- yeah, controller <laughs> highly recommended. Yeah. <laughs> so I've just been using, I have a Logitech, um, controller that works really well and has actually a pretty good d-pad so i've just been using that but um i will say that it's got at least from what i can tell so far it has all of the old power-ups that you would expect from metroid 2 it seems to have some extra ones in there as well he's done a really good job i so far i've not gotten stuck despite intentionally trying to sequence break (laughs) at parts which you can kind of you can kind of like play around with doing that and yet i haven't gotten stuck because there's there's parts in the game where you think you think you might get stuck, but there's always kind of a way out. You just kind of have to look for it. Mm -hmm. Um, to use an example, I sort of cheesed my way into this area that you're not supposed to get into until you get super missiles by very carefully using my bombs to create a running platform so that I could use my speed boost to run across a flat surface and power through the, like there's some blockers that you have to have the super speed to get through. Mm -hmm. So I was I you're not supposed to do it in this way. So I kind of tricky did it in this way and so that I could go straight through. Um, but the only way to get out, the only way to get in was supposed to be through super missiles. I didn't think I could get out without super missiles too. But I found another way out. Oh, interesting. So little things like that. And um, there's definitely parts where obviously since there's a lot of like lava and things like that, um, 
so far, I haven't found any place where, oh, I'm going to fall in this pit and now I'm just dead. There always seems like ways to get out of pits too, which is pretty nice. Mm. As I recall from playing the original on the Game Boy, I don't remember that being the case. Mm. I remember like accidentally falling into a pit before and being very frustrated because there's literally no way out. And you just <laughs> you have can't to kill s- yourself. <laughs> right. Well, you, you kill yourself because you're being your health is being slowly drained because oh, you're in lava. Oh, but okay. I mean, there's no way for you to get out of it, so you just have to sit there for like five minutes. And let <laughs> Um, you would think lava would kill you faster than five minutes. Well, I'm exaggerating, oh, okay. but but it feel it feels like an eternity when you because you know you're going to die. You're just like, well, I just want to die. Please, just let me die. <laughs> boy, do I know that feeling. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I won't go too much into it. Um, I'm about, I believe, forty ish percent in. The last thing that I looked, so I'm actually I've been playing it quite a bit. So I'm per- I'm relatively far into the game. I'm far enough to comfortably recommend the game and say that it's if you are a metroid fan it's well worth playing it is completely up there with um a game like metroid fusion um or zero mission so it's definitely now it's it's different because the whole point is you're hunting metroids so it's a little it's a little bit more linear because it's intentionally trying to go with the style of metroid 2 Mm -hmm. um but gameplay wise it, it works quite well i will say the one thing that took me a little bit to get used to was um the way he did space jump i had a little bit of trickiness and i think it might have just been the way my controller is set up there's or it could have just been the the way he programmed it you can't when you're doing the space jump you really shouldn't do it on the apex of your jump you have to do your jump you do you go up you go you hit your 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 apex and then you drop a tiny bit and then jump back up again as opposed to you can just keep like tapping the button as fast as you can that doesn't work you'll fall Little things like that. That's the only thing that I would say is, is kind of got to me on the controls. This is the Gaming Meta. News and commentary about the games industry and gamer culture. The reason why he released Metroid 2 Remake yesterday, August 6th, is because August 6th is the 30th anniversary of Metroid. Oh, really? Um, it came out in Japan for the Famicom Disc, disc System in 1986 on August on uh, August 6th 8686 yes 8686 oh you're kidding <laughs> and then it came out in America um, in 1987 also in August so same thing uh, the exact release date in America is not exactly like well it's not known I hope it was August 7th yeah we, we could have been <laughs> but it was it was still August so we we're, did things we're just one year back then. <laughs> A bit um, like Target does it now. So one of the things that I thought was a little bit weird, because there, there's definitely a huge Metroid fan base in America, and I understand that in Japan it's not as popular of a game series. But Nintendo, it still surprised me, because Nintendo didn't really put out any sort of celebration about Metroid. They, when both Mario and, and Zelda have recently had their anniversaries too, and when they came out, they would do deals on their, their stores, like the Wii U store, or the 3DS store. They would tweet something out on social media sites. They would put something on their website and say, hey, look at these games, or, or oh, hey, buy the old version of Legend of Zelda because it's the 30th anniversary or something. Mm-hmm. They didn't do anything for Metroid, almost like it didn't happen. Um, so I thought it was a little bit odd that they would just forget in my opinion uh one of their biggest franchises oh there's no way they forgot um, they had to have made that a calculated decision yeah and maybe they did and and so do you have any any possible like ideas about oh i why totally they done i have a guys? theory too but let you go yeah first. well I, I think it, yeah. it's very very simple i think um any kind of female character i think it, it's totally on gender lines any, any female character well, right now on. Samus is a girl? Yeah, sorry, spoilers. No. <laughs> Wait, you mean Metroid is a girl? <laughs> Metroid, 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 Metroid. No, Metroid 2 is a girl. We established it. Um, but no, I, I, think it's, I think it's any any female character in a video game right now is toxic. I think it is socially toxic, uh, which is stupid. Stupid, I agree. stupid, it's stupid. Dumb as hell. Uh, but I think that probably it, it came up in a board meeting and it was shot down as being, you know what, we're going to open a huge can of worms if we do something in, with Samus. Let's just not even go there. Uh, given some of the recent reaction to things like, oh, what, there's no female link and, and stuff like that. That's that's what oh, I think. Gosh. Or the They're reaction to her costume that. in Smash Bros. Or right, whatever. exactly. Yeah. Uh, or, or, you know, you, you can even think back to the, the other M fiasco. Um, you know, I'm not familiar with that game. Yeah, I didn't think you were. <laughs> Wait, what's the other M? What's that? <laughs> Is this different other Metroid? Is this like an alternate Metroid? You know, I hear they're going to make some, uh, that's, some that's, Star Wars prequels too. That's why they called it Other M. It was basically they're telling you go ahead and play 
another metro. <laughs> no, <laughs> don't, don't blame them. Uh, but no, I, I think that's my honest answer. I, I think that they didn't want to take the risk of accidentally hmm. opening a can of um, uh, gender politics. Do, do you think, and that could have been part, I think that's absurd. Not that I think that your your suggestion is absurd. I actually think that's pot, very possible. Well, I think you dress funny. <laughs> oh, well, I do, but um, <laughs> for those no, I've been nice in the video today, team. by the way. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Pop call um, yeah. in honor of the eighties. Yes. Um, no, I, I think that's that's certainly possible. I think it's ridiculous if that is true, but it's certainly possible. I think it could also just be that there was a big fan backlash for Federation Force um, being called a Metroid game, and I. I I don't have a problem with the game itself, but it's it's just not a Metroid game. And I think Metroid fans have been wanting another Metroid game, which we haven't had for some time. Most don't even count Other Rim as a Metroid game mm-hmm. um, because of how how poorly it was put together um, and how poorly it was received. So it could just be Nintendo doesn't want to remind gamers, "Hey, uh, we we're not making another Metroid game. We don't plan to make another Metroid game. So go ahead and just forget about this series." That. That, that's kind of my theory. So that, that's a little bit closer to what mine is, and yeah. I can sort of see both of those sort of playing into it. I think my theory is basically just that, um, it, you know, it's sort of like every five years or so that, like, you kind of have the anniversary years of 20, 25. Those are big ones. Um, usually, though, I've noticed the game companies, not just the Nintendo, um, have big anniversaries when they have something big to release in that series or something to announce in that series. And in this case, like, you know, they are working at Federation Force, but it's not another, like, sort of main title Metroid game. And I think because, as you said in recent uh, recent memory, it's been things like Other Am and stuff like that that hasn't really been, like, big Metroid hits. Mm-hmm. I think it's just that they... It's really just been they, Other M, right? They, they don't want to distract from their other initiatives right now to give too much attention to the anniversary of a series that they're not really going to be doing anything with, if that makes sense. Well, so, like, I could see, say, in another five years, mm-hmm. like, you know, if they've got another Metroid coming out then, it's like, hey, guys, it's 35 years of Metroid, and then it's a big anniversary again. So while we're talking about Nintendo, and this plays into it, I figure we should probably mention, because I don't know if we did last time, the um, the NES Mini that they're releasing yeah. that's coming out. Mm-hmm. Sort of like, I, if, you, if you've seen this Yeah, you stuff, can hold it in your hand, kind of thing. <laughs> right. It's like it's doing something similar to... Well, they're not. That's, but, that was that's not true. That was oh, so no. sites were saying that that's oh. actually not true. Okay, well, never mind then. That, I that, thought that was like a plug and play console mm, or whatever. Or is that not just not true? The Sega the Sega one has been out for quite a while. It is a plug and play console. It is it is very it is very poor emulation of the Sega system. It's been out for a while. It's been very poorly reviewed. Wow. Um, this Nintendo one is completely different. They're in, they're trying to make it like accurate emulation of the games that they put on there. The Sega one also has lets you plug in carts. This one, the Nintendo one, does not. Mm. People are speculating that they're going to be cannibalizing old um, Wii chips, which uh, the Wii has actually been known for um, having very accurate emulation. Yeah, or, that's why they yeah. have a virtual console. Exactly. Whereas the Wii U does not, by the way. It's the Wii specifically that has very accurate um, emulation. And so, since they have so many of those chips, the speculation is they're going to be using those um, the old Wii chips and basically putting these games on, on, on those chips. Cool. Does so, that mean the value of my Wii is actually going to go up and I can trade it in for more than $20 <laughs> GameStop? I, no, it's, it's actually just going to get on to 15 because now they can pay people less. Right. Oh. So, so there's more supply and you know, less demand. So, but, but speaking <laughs> of that, the game selection on there, of course, I, I thought was pretty interesting, but they did include Metroid mm. in, in that, which, which I think, of course, is a good idea because it is one of the, the better NES games. Mm-hmm. They do have 30 games on there. Yeah. Um, classic first party. Yeah, it's a classic game. It's first party. It's no brainer. So it's not. So you could you could argue that there is another Metroid game coming out. They could have mentioned, oh hey, it's Metroid Thirty, and you can play the original on <laughs> the Nest the Nest Mini. But they didn't. That well, just seems they've... like if that's the only Metroid thing that they're doing, it's like, oh hey, thirtieth anniversary, play this first game right. well, again. Yeah. And they are doing Federation <laughs> Force too, which is oh, like, is that coming out this year? I th- it may have even come out already, but it's, I believe it is coming out this year. I'm not particularly interested in that anyway. So. No, no one is. That's, probably, that's why <laughs> exactly. I think they're not mentioning it. Because they, yeah. just, just, they realize people are not as, as into it. Um, I, I wish they had just not called it Metroid. It just it said Federation 4. Well, it's, it's set in the same world as Metroid, so you kind of have to have it in the title. But it didn't have to be set in the same world. That's, that's what true. I'm saying. It's like they, they chose to do that to try to get recognition because they didn't want to do a new property. Yeah. Anyway, we're, we're getting off track, but I was just curious while we're talking about that NAS Mini... Um, because one of the things that excited me about it was there, it comes with controllers, and it's kind of hard to find a really good like NES control that actually has rubber buttons mm-hmm. and all the. So if these are actually real, using like actual le- legitimate parts, which Nintendo 
probably will use. That's kind of the whole point of this thing is to be nostalgic. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I might get one literally just to have a controller. Because it's USB. No, it's not USB. It's not it, USB? It, it's, it is, the, it's the type that plugs into the bottom of your Wiimote. Um, yes. Oh. So you can plug it directly into the console, but you can also plug it in as an accessory for your uh, your Wii or your Wii U. Oh, okay. Um, I'm going to use it to play Mario Maker. <laughs> you can use it to play Mario <laughs> yeah. Maker. Oh, yeah. You could, you, I bet you can probably already use been play um, NES Remix. Yeah. So can you, can you plug it directly into your Wii U? Or just does it have to plug into the Wii controller? Probably the controller, but the Wii U uh, the game thing. had yeah. as that plug-in as well. Yeah. Right. So. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm sort of, I'm looking forward to it just it because it's actually very cheap. It has a good price, and I like a lot of those games, and I also like the look of it, even though I actually ha have all of these already via emulation. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them via, like, virtual console. But I still kind of think it's worth picking up. There, there's something about emulation that, like, even if it gets pretty close, it always just feels a little bit off. I like being able to play something that's kind of designed to natively run it, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. And I think these, this... I mean, I'm going to wait for reviews, obviously. I, I do want to make sure that it is at least um, accurate. Mm -hmm. But I, I trust Nintendo to make an accurate product. And I do think it's very possible, if this is a success, that Sega will come out with one that is like this in that same vein where they're actually trying to be completely accurate mm -hmm. to the old system. Unfortunately, the, the, the Sega ones that have come out were not made by Sega. They were made by, I think it was AT Games or something like that. Mm -hmm. I forget the company. Um, the biggest problem that I've heard with those, a couple of things. One is I've heard there's a little bit of input lag on some of the games, but the main thing is the sound. Mm. So, uh, some of the games are just horribly horrible, and including if you put in your own cart, like mm. not even the ones that are on the system. If you put in a Sega Genesis cartridge into the into it and play it, the sound will still be wrong because it's not even using the right hardware. Mm. Hmm. So that's why I'm saying this is a very different thing. This is You can't put NES games into it. You have to actually only play the 30 that are on there. And Nintendo has even said they're not even going to have add-on packs, which I think is a big mistake. They're not even going to have add-on packs. It's just, these are the 30 games you're going to get, period. That's a terrible idea. Yeah, it seems odd, and I wonder if they're doing that because either A, they really are going to have add-on packs, they just don't want to tell people yet because they don't, they don't want to, like, I don't know, overwhelm from a marketing standpoint. If they don't sell well, then they'd have to right. do or, or they might come out with another one. Exactly. They go, here's, they, they use it. Kind of like how they had Net, NES Remix and NES Remix 2. Exactly. Uh, and good. you have to buy a completely different box that yeah. has 30 different games on it. Well, your so, controllers would be worn out by then. You'll want one anyway. Yeah. So I don't, so I don't know. I mean, if it, if it does really well, obviously they're going to do something else because that would just be silly not to. Or they just come out with like a Super Nintendo version of yeah, it yeah. as well. They might do that next. Might be even do a N64 version eventually. Mm -hmm. What's the, what's the price on it? Um, fifty, I believe. Uh, 50, or fifty or sixty. That's well worth buying more than once. Yeah, it's it's basically it's the price of a game. It's the price yeah. of a game, and you're and getting you get 30, games. thirty games and a controller, so it's pretty cool. Yeah, or you can go to the swap meet and get the one they make in Mexico that has three hundred games. I, I could even see if they did a, another <laughs> NES one, they True. could sort of make it look like the Super Famicom. You know, even if it's NES, it just it, it looks different, so you can like kind of have like your little collection of a different. Oh, you editions. mean you mean like the actual the old Famicom? Right? Yeah, yeah. Or they could do because they have the um, the second model of the NES, the top the uh, mm -hmm. top loader. Mm -hmm. So they could also have that version. So I mean, they could do. There's a whole bunch of interesting things they could do with yeah. it. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm kind of. It I'm, might be I'm cool just to have it. around just as a you know figurine almost. Mm -hmm. Just like, hey, I've got an NES type thing on my desk. Then I can plug into my TV and play if I want. To. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's true. Um, <clears throat> or, your, or your monitor whenever the boss isn't looking. But uh, before we wrap this segment, I'd be remiss if I because uh, I, I couldn't. I was going to bring it up earlier, but uh, you guys were still talking. Um, but it sounds like they're uh, taking advantage of those those Wii um, that hardware. So I guess you could say it's Wii cycling. No. Uh, no. All right, show. That was over. weak. <laughs> oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> Chris, Chris, Doc beat you. That that was even worse. Pun. <laughs> I've been I've been taking lessons from Phil Parsons. We should move on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. And now this week's meaty topic of discussion. So let's talk Gunpoint. Uh, Gunpoint is a game for the PC made by uh, Tom Francis. Does he have like a, a studio title or anything like that? Uh, I don't think so. A studio title? Oh, you mean like just like the name of his studio? His Not Twitter Tom handle Francis is Pentadact or something like that. Yeah, yeah Pentadact actually. So it's his website. Oh, okay. Yeah, I used to use Tom Francis as a, a case study whenever mm -hmm. I taught history of game design. One of the reasons why I used him, even though he's a modern example, is because of the way that he promoted his own stuff and the way he promoted Gunpoint when it first came out. So mm -hmm. I'm really excited about this game and, and about talking about this game because I've been mm -hmm. watching it for a long time. Um, I, I am to Gunpoint as Jim is to Metroid, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Ah. 
I don't know about that. <laughs> not, 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 in, not in fan devotion, but in having watched it for a really long time. <laughs> oh, oh, you meant the remake project. Wait, like, so yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you meant the series. So I'm like, so wait, are we? Are we I've, I've that, been watching this development. Yeah, I've been, I've been watching I've been this development this a long time. That's what I Are we saying the gunpoint guy is a girl? No. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh. Conway is a girl. Conway could be. <laughs> what, what if Gunpoint is a girl? <laughs> uh, <laughs> see what you think that character's yeah. name is Gunpoint? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Oh boy! Anyway, um, so we uh, we've all we've all played it, um, and we are going to talk about it. It it sort of has. I mean, just first impressions of it when I when I first started playing it. Sort of that kind of has this like noir detective mm -hmm. um, style to it, which that kind of grabbed me right away. With also the um, sort of environmental sounds, like mm -hmm. all the, like the rain. Yeah, um, the glass breaking. Yeah, like it's always stuff. nighttime. You know, you got the the street lamps on the streets, mm -hmm. and you got mm -hmm. the uh, the music's definitely very noir. I love the art style on that game. Yeah, yeah, it's it's great. So, one of the things that I like um, a lot about Tom Francis's whole philosophy of design is he's very big believer in being able to describe your game uh, to a jerk. He doesn't use the word jerk. <laughs> um, Nail. In, yeah, in in one to two sentences. And he's very precise about what those sentences are and what they mean and that sort of a thing. Um, so uh, maybe we can, like, link to some information on that, That even the presentation I used to give yeah. on that. Because um, he, he gave a talk, basically, about how to pitch your game to an yeah, animal. Yeah, and right. it's a really I, th I think talk. he used Gunpoint as his example. It's like, he okay, did. so if I want to pitch right. my game, here's what and, I would And, say. in fact, what he said was, Gunpoint is a stealth puzzle game that lets you rewire its levels to trick people. You play as a freelance spy who takes jobs from his clients to break into high security buildings and steal sensitive data. And that's like, I mean, that's a perfect description of the game. You know exactly right. what you're getting into with it. Um, he also calls it a 2D stealth game about rewiring things and punching people. <laughs> Yes, because those are the things that you do in that game. Yeah, you rewire things and you punch people. You can you can also jump. You have like special spring jumpy legs. What do they call like, like like bullfrog bullfrog jumpers or something like pants that? It. Yeah. yeah. So I, what what I really like about the game is it's a very simple mechanic. Um, it's kind of innovative. I would put it up there with um, sort of like portal like innovation yes. type mm -hmm. mechanics. Yeah, absolutely. Um, in that we just haven't seen it before. Uh, so you, there's this this sort of overlay map you can flip to by scrolling your mouse wheel and then you rewire the, the wires in the building. So for an example, um, a light switch, you might have a wire that runs from the light switch to the light yeah. overhead. What you can do is rewire it so it doesn't go to the light switch. You can have it actually go to the light switch and then to something else. Right. But you can also just have the light switch open a door, which before can only be opened by a hand scanner that a guard would use. Exactly. So you can't open the door unless you rewire the light switch to open the door for you. And did you right. guys catch the, the in-world explanation for why that works? Um, basically, the, Everything it's all done with software. software. Yeah, yeah, and I just I oh love that. yeah, and I I noticed that that's something I did want to mention. I mean, there it, it does seem like he's gone to some effort to explain the way some of these things work in the yeah. world, but I just didn't care to be perfectly honest. No, um, I I liked I actually liked the way that the game plays. I like sort of that puzzle atmosphere for mm -hmm. it, and I found myself just skipping through all the all the dialogue the and just going oh, yeah. straight to the game. Well, interestingly, I think he understands that a lot of people are going to be like that. Yeah, because yeah. they have the yeah, oh, yeah. They, there's just a start no, mission button that's always there. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's set up really well. So he's got that information for those that really want to get into the lore, and then he also just has, hey, if you just want to get into the game and play it. Go for it. There's also the optional objectives where you can pick up laptops that have information and like a wall of text mm -hmm. that you can read or you can just See, ignore. And I yeah. always pick up the laptops because I want to complete. I want. I'm a completionist, but mm -hmm. I never read it because right, I, yeah. I click it and go, "Okay, close." Yeah, I got that's it. Funny. Mm -hmm. So something I like to ask you guys about your play style is because I sort of see this game as a puzzler. You know, it's about trying to figure out mm -hmm. how I can, you know, one be stealthy and get through this without getting killed. Because the guards are, it's the type, and it's something that um, I don't think I talked about Hotline Miami on here. Um, but Hotline Miami has like the the guards that are too perfect in a way because the game's kind of about um, knowing exactly what you need to do and yes. getting, like doing it perfectly. And so if you give them an inch, they will shoot you immediately. And, right. and it has um, that quick restart that Hotline Miami had as well. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can auto so, uh, reload an auto save to like you know however many seconds ago. Yeah, so. even up to zero seconds before, which mm -hmm. is just immediately getting shot again. Yeah. Is, huh? yeah. Um, but I actually I like that system a lot better than like Hotline Miami because Hotline Miami forces you to replay the entire floor. Yeah. yeah. Uh, That's true. Whereas yeah. this lets you just like undo them a, a mistake, couple of seconds. Yeah. Um, um, but with that being said, you know, because it's a puzzler, I had to sit there and think about, okay, like what do I need to wire? I need to have this happen in this order and then I need to wait for him to be there so I can close the door on him, that sort of thing. Um, 
And so there's a par time for each level. And I think that the idea is that if you go back and you replay it, especially with the new items that you acquire throughout the game, because you're allowed to keep your items if you go back and replay mm-hmm. missions. Um, oh, really? There's, like, I guess, almost like a, a speed running sort of element where even at the end of every stage, it says, how is your time? You yeah. know, and like my time bar is always full. Optimal. <laughs> and so like, do you guys play it more as kind of like an action game or do you play it more as a puzzler and take your time? Because I kind of feel like it was in a way wanting you to play it very quickly. Oh, it's puzzler for me completely. Yeah. I've actually played it multiple ways. Mm. Um, really? I've gone through and done like a total stealth playthrough where you don't touch anybody. You don't hurt anybody. No mm. violence whatsoever. Mm-hmm. No detection, no noise. Everything. Oh, that's cool. I'm going to try that. Yeah. It's, it's very fun. It's, it, it'll definitely be slower cause you have to think oh, about yeah. everything. And it's not even non-lethal. It's like literally no violence. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tried the non-lethal run and mm-hmm. at the end of it discovered I had killed eight people, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which was fascinating. Yeah. I didn't realize that I had, there, there were a few kind of little accidents. Mm-hmm. Like where you knock somebody off the building, yeah, and that, that kind of thing. And so I, there were one or two where I was like, okay, I accidentally just killed that guy, and I know I did. And instead of choosing to reload, I just went with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at the very end, whenever you have the dialogue choices that that come from the, the well, there's it, there's two layers to it. First of all, you get dialogue choices based on the things that you've done. Mm-hmm. You can't choose stuff you haven't done, and then sort of three dialogue choices within that context of the type of snarky you want to be mm-hmm. or not be within it. And so uh, I actually chose the dialogue option, which was, I think I actually killed more people than mm-hmm. I tried to save. Uh, so, you're, so you're talking you about not just guy, not just dialogue options. You're talking about specifically like the little Mad Lib. Yeah. Um, sort of like epilogue. Yeah, monologue. at the at the end. In um, fact, I can read you my epilogue. Yeah. It's, it's really, really <laughs> I good. Share this, nine, oh, it's nine dead. It was an eight. It was mm-hmm. Nine dead, 36 injured, 20 jobs, $13,000. The week echoed in my mind like a gunshot in an empty street. They don't let me name names on this blog, but the person behind the hit I was investigating is probably being picked up by the East Point police about now. I er, may have killed more people than I actually avenged here. <laughs> so whatever I got that, and there's more, but uh, mm-hmm. when I actually clicked on that one, I got a... Uh, a trophy or an award and it was uh uh ludo uh, uh, narrative, narrative dissonance, dissonance. nice <laughs> <laughs> and i just that was oh, that was my yeah. moment the, yeah. the, game, the game's very self-aware um yes, that's something is. where i think that the overall tone was good in the sense that it wasn't taking itself too seriously mm-hmm. um there's a tendency i think for a lot of games now and i don't think it's a bad thing because the games are about having fun and so a lot of developers almost like militaristically, and I'm not saying this is the case with Gunpoint, but I almost say, like, you know, games should not take themselves too seriously, and they must just be fun and goofy and whatever. Which is, um, and then there's also the philosophy that's... There's the opposite of that, yeah, too. Which you have to be super serious, and you can't be goofy at all. Mm-hmm. I think this one struck a nice balance. I would say overall, it felt more goofy than serious. Mm-hmm. Um, but there were certainly serious moments. Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, it let the player choose how serious they wanted it to be. It was mm-hmm. kind of flow theory, narrative, and action. It didn't change anything about the gameplay. Not really. It it just changed the experience. And so mm-hmm. that reminds me again of like Firewatch where nothing actually changes except your own memory of your own playthrough. Mm-hmm. And it still affects the playthrough. And it's, this is an interesting design concept to me. I want to talk about more about that um, in, in some future episode. Cause mm-hmm. that, that to me, I think has a lot of potential. Now, since we're talking about, the writing. Did you guys like the writing? Did the different characters feel different? Jim, you wouldn't know you didn't read it. Uh, Yeah, I I, I skimmed over some of it. And I mean, he did do this. I thought it was kind of interesting that he would write the characters in different ways since Mm -hmm. it was all text. So some people would type with uh, like, I think it was the second, the second girl in one of the missions, the one who gets arrested. Yeah. Yeah. And like, so she, she didn't really use like proper grammar or capitalization, that kind of thing. You can even call her out on that if you want. Right. (laughs) So it it feels like a different, a different person. Um, so yeah, I do think that, that he, he certainly went to a great effort to make these feel like different characters. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you're right. I didn't, I didn't take a lot of time to read through them. So beyond that, I can't. He, he's a really salty guy. I mean, obviously, you know, his, uh, like, like, whenever he did his speech on uh, how to talk to a jerk, uh, you know, he used lots of colorful language, um, f bombs, mm-hmm. not not shy in the game at all or in person. Well, uh, he's, he's British, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, but so, he's. Yeah. Well, that, that, that well, somehow changes. Well, no, because it, it, there's there's kind of like it's excused if you're British. There's there's a different standard for what is kind of like media friendly over in Britain versus well, the US. Well, that's true. That's like you point. just look at our TV and it's very. That's different. a very good point. Um, well, yeah. Uh, so, but but I guess my point is, um, whenever you bring that into a game space, and then that colors all the characters. 
I mean, there was literally one um, one option where I, I, I couldn't not swear. All three options were swears. Mm. Um, and that's just, I don't know, it changes the gameplay experience for me. Because... I just it's not it's not who I am it's not what I do. Um, so well, you're I also will, playing as different kind of versions of Conway the character, right? Mm-hmm. And and so I guess that's where I'm going with this yeah. question, uh, which is do, does does that sort of a thing um, hurt an experience, help an experience, um, or are you like you know what it was noir and it's about shooting people and it you know. Just go jumping, with it, Doc. Jumping through windows. Well, yeah. it's about so, shooting people or not shooting people. Yeah. So there, there's so, an interesting sure, sure. there's an interesting question I think that ties into that, which is the dialogue options and how, like you said, that you can sort of be as serious or as goofy as you want to be. And there's also the thing where, like, for example, you can ask a question and then not ask the two other questions, right? Um, or you can even just hang up early um, and start the mission. But I think that. Because there, there's a sort of a philosophy that I took when I was writing my game, and I have yet to finish it, but the, when I did my master's thesis, I had this thing that I did where I included information, and instead of just sort of like having characters talk at you to teach you about something, mm-hmm. I would sneak information in that your character would know by having dial- dialogue options that are things that you could say as this character, because you know, so you're right. reading all three and you're learning about all three, even though you only pick one. And so in that same way, I felt like even though there's kind of like the, the straightforward answer, like the short to the point answer. And then there's also like kind of like the goofy sarcastic answer. Mm-hmm. I kind of felt like because I saw those two or three options, my overall sense was that Conway is supposed to be the sarcastic guy. Yeah. Even though you could play him as completely straight. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, and so I definitely got the sense as I was playing that, you know, Conway has a very particular character. Um, and that I'm just sort of like playing, as you said, the different versions of Conway. That makes um, sense. but what do you, what do you think about that too? Because I think that, you know, like if you're, if you're giving people options to play in different ways without sort of distinguishing and like, I don't want to say that it's necessarily a good thing. If you have like, we know that up is always Paragon and down is always Renegade, you know, like, I, I feel like even then, like, you sort of have the same shepherd and it's just kind of like this sort of like this oscillation of shepherd going mm-hmm. in those different directions. I'm not sure if it works super well to have two completely different characters reflect in different dialogue options, especially given that you can have them choose the different options in any given time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I know. I agree with that. And I think for me, my experience with, with the character was, was completely up to how I played the game. It's like we were talking about, you can approach it stealthily. You can actually try to try to kill it. Like for me, I just wanted to get through the level. Mm-hmm. So I've been playing as a very, pragmatic a pragmatic approach to everything so if i if i can get past this person and i can kill them and that's faster i'll do it mm-hmm. so i'm playing as a very pragmatic so that's been my approach and that so that's the way that i view conway it's like he's just the no nonsense i'm gonna get this job done any means necessary um y'all's perspective is probably going to be very different if you're oh, not yeah. playing that way i didn't even buy the gun so right so you might not you might not think of him in that way i, I actually i'm not i didn't buy the gun either because i would much rather jump people out windows. That's my favorite way to kill someone. <laughs> nice. Is to just jump out windows and like land on top of them. And then punch them continuously. <laughs> well, they're already dead, actually. Actually, I know, but you can still punch them. The, the, yeah, if you the, punch the, them ten times, they die. The little tool tips that pop up on the bottom, which if you're playing full screen on a big monitor, you don't notice very often. But yeah. like, for example, if you punch someone repeatedly to the point where they die, it's like, uh, you only need to punch them once to knock them out. Like, it right. actually says, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is kind of funny. There's no reason to continue punching them 370,000 times. <laughs> I must have missed that because, um, because I've never punched someone just once. So I've always just <laughs> yeah. like, like 20 times just, just in case it's like, okay, he's not moving anymore. That's hilarious. So I don't know. So maybe my Conway is a little bit aggressive. Uh, <laughs> <anger issues. laughs> yeah. Like standing on top of someone and punching them like 50 uh, times. Um, cause I can, I can click that mouse button real fast. I'll tell you that. Um, set up a macro. That actually <laughs> brings up an interesting point because we're playing as a character who has a set personality as being kind of goofy, as you said. Mm-hmm. And obviously we can choose when to be goofy. Right. But that also raises the question. It's like, well, is he a violent person or is he a sneaky person? But I, but know? like I was saying, it, I think it's up to your interpretation, which which I like. It's mm-hmm. it's very different from the approach of, of, you know, that Bioware used in Mass Effect, which I think is a complete cop-out. The whole super binary, you're either a paragon or a renegade. Right. No, I mean, that's that's nonsense. I mean, mm-hmm. people, people... The are world sh- isn't pe- black and white. Right. Pe- blue and well, white. people are shades <laughs> of gray. And in this, in this case, you have all these, these little gradations and options... I'm not going around kill, like trying to kill people. That's mm-hmm. not the way that I view my, my playthrough. I view it as I am trying to complete the objectives in the most pragmatic way possible and, and quickest way possible. Mm-hmm. And so if that means I have to kill them, then I will do it. But if it means that I can get through without them seeing me, then I'll do that too. I've actually, I've actually played the game so, where you deliberately kill everybody. Yeah. 
see because I think it's an achievement for that if you kill everybody in the game. And uh, it's very slow and boring, honestly. Yeah, and that's, that's not the way it. I play. I, I, honestly, I've been going for speed, and I, I typically do the do each of the um, levels relatively fast because mm-hmm. that's my approach. But um, I, I really like that the game gives you all of these different options because your experience might be, hey, Conway is this super stealthy guy, and he, he just sneaks in and out, and no one ever knows he's there, and he never draws the attention of the guards and never... Um, you know, never attacks any of the guards. They don't even know that anyone was there. That might be y'all's approach. Well, you see, I think then you kind of get to this point where you can sort of say, and, and I, I do think it's the case and it works because it's such a short game. Conway can kind of be whoever you want him to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I think that there's like that weird sort of cognitive, like a cognitive dissonance that happens when you see like the two sides being reflected, say in the dialogue choices. Mm-hmm. And it's the fact that you can swing wildly from in this mission, I'm serious and stealthy in the next mission. I'm goofy and uh, you know, I'm, I'm killing everything. Uh, this strikes me as a little bit odd. And so in a sense, he kind of seems unbalanced as a character. Mm-hmm. Um, importantly, you know, to go back to the shepherd example in mass effect, you know, Paragon and Renegade, yes, they're kind of like two binary things, but they said that Paragon is doing the right thing the right way. Renegade is doing the right thing by any, mes- any means necessary. And you could have a character, and they write Shepard such that it makes sense that he could make a pretty big, like, you know, if you do Paragon one sentence and Renegade the next sentence, mm-hmm. it doesn't feel dissonant, if that makes sense. Ultimately, you're still the good guy. Yeah. Yeah, you're you're still this heroic character. Interesting. Um, and so, and in this case, you're not necessarily a hero. You're a private spy, and that's kind of a shady, right. shady business anyway. Yeah. But just the the degree to which I almost wonder, you know, to avoid that sort of oscillation that I'm talking about, if it might be possible to design it such that your dialogue options start looking a little bit different as you sort of establish your personality. We've sort of figured this many missions in that you are generally serious straight to the point and so maybe we open up more options in the series straight to the point vein instead of showing you all of the options that you have to be like sarcastic or whatever else but it's interesting to me how with conway you have a character who's kind of like only loosely defined and then you kind of define it as you mm-hmm. play whereas mm-hmm. in a lot of other video games it's either like you know link from zelda where you just kind of project yourself onto mm-hmm. him because yeah, he doesn't say anything yeah he's yeah or it's like, you know, you're playing as Nico Bellic from mm-hmm. GTA four. You yeah. know, like that you're you just play him and you 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 don't determine what he does or how he I'm acts. Having flashbacks to, to an our, extent. Uh, you to an extent. You, yeah. make, you make a couple of big choices. Well, you make a lot of big choices. in GTA, one of your biggest choices is, you know, how do you, how do you react to the innocent people that are around you? Right. So that's a huge choice. I mean But I mean in terms of the story, because I've always thought that GTA doesn't do a very good job of balancing the gameplay with the story. Because the story is very... Oh, we need to have a whole episode on this. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm having flashbacks to just, 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 just my brief <laughs> uh, argument, though. Uh, in, in the story, it's very linear, and Nico is set as a certain type of character, but you know, when you go into a mission, or even if you just go out in the open world, you can kill whoever you want for no reason, or you can just you know be a nice guy who drives safely. You know, so it, but that doesn't affect the story at all. Correct. Yeah, you're right. It does not affect the story. That that I agree with. Right. There's a disconnect there. Yeah, there yeah. there there is somewhat of a disconnect. There. Mm-hmm. I, I do think that it it works because of the sort of character that you're playing. So you can kind of you can justify it either way. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, you're I'm just trying to be under the radar yeah. until I go kill these people, or oh, I've killed so many people, I don't care if I run over a couple. Yeah. But, so, but regardless, but like, I, I do see your point. Yeah. My my point wasn't about GTA. It was more just like you have a character in a game who is a set character yeah. and they don't change in the story and mm-hmm. it doesn't really change how you play so if you're if you're interested in uh, sort of exploring this discussion a little bit more uh, episode three of our podcast uh, defining avatar we had a uh, very lengthy discussion uh, this is back when richard was on the podcast about um what's the difference between an avatar and a player character yeah um you know we i think we came up with the new term caricature to sort of describe that something that's in between or maybe a different category entirely uh so go check that one out um i think it was a good discussion too as i recall yeah it was a good one i liked it um it's actually one of our, our spotlight episodes on soundcloud um but i'm interested to hear you guys' thoughts on the gameplay specifically like you're in the level you're playing the game uh what were sort of like general impressions likes dislikes of that i i mean i appreciated that you had different approaches um, although you didn't have quite as many options as I would have expected, um, there was still that, that sense of, oh, okay, I need to make sure that I, um, 
get to this blue rewire, mm -hmm. or what was it called, wire link, I think? Uh, wire jack. Wire jack, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got to get the blue wire jack so that then I can affect the blue things, and then I can use the blue things to get to the yellow wire jack. So there's still a little bit of, like, linearity. Especially and, early on. Especially um, early on, yeah. The, yeah, they're, they're definitely... It felt a lot like, you know, that was the sort of puzzle, the element of yes. like, mm -hmm. here, here is this level and there's clearly like, you know, one, maybe two ways to solve it. Right. But you still have options for how you're, you're passing the guards. Sure. Like, you know, mm -hmm. you can electrocute them. You can play with the lights and trick them into doing yeah. something. You can lock them in a room. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of, so there are still options for mm -hmm. getting through, which I did appreciate. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, honestly, I, I liked the almost... I guess I'd call it like a relaxed atmosphere. That at least I felt when I played, even though I had, I did, that was I music. was kind of violent. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it was a combination of the music and then most of the gameplay being um, spent sort of doing the whole like cross linking where you're, mm -hmm. you're changing the wiring. Yeah, really, yeah. So to me, that felt like a lot of it was just, Oh, I'm just playing around the, the, the with the wires and Oh, let's see how this plays out. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of that. So it, it didn't feel like a, it wasn't, I wouldn't call it a tense game and probably it was helped by the fact that um, you can always load your game back like a few seconds yeah. if something yeah. happens. Yeah, there wasn't the risk of having to start all the way mm -hmm. over. And it's worth noting, too, that for anyone who hasn't played this, that the wirejacking, it happens in real time, but you don't have to be physically anywhere in particular. Oh, the cross-linking. The cross-linking, yeah. Cross -linking, yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. You can... You can um, be anywhere in the building or outside the building and mess with any of the wires. Which is fantastic. Yeah. You still have to physically go to the switch to flip it yes. or whatever. But, or someone else has to flip uh, it. But you don't have to move a copper wire. But, but, to, right. no, but no, you, you don't have to like expose yourself for five minutes while you're back into yeah, the Because it's, uh, it's all virtual. <laughs> but I agree. I agree. <laughs> I agree with Jim completely. I think it uh, was a very serene kind of game. Um, it's definitely kind of an art game. It's it's a puzzler, but it, I, I, would, I, agree. I would put it up yeah. there with, with true work of art <laughs> in the sense that um, it was unlike anything else. Mm -hmm. If if you kind of imagine being a guard late at night in a building, nothing's happening. Nothing's going to happen. Your job is to stand around and be awake alone in a hallway all night. Mm -hmm. That's what these guards are doing and experiencing. And you almost kind of get a little bit of a feeling of that until something happens and there's a noise or, or glass breaks. And then they like freak out mm -hmm. and they run over to the window and they're like, ha, 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 what's going on? Mm -hmm. And, it just it's great. Yeah. I, I think that that all of that is is communicated with that noir context, the the night, the rain, the um, you know just the trench coat itself and the mm -hmm. hat, mm -hmm. all of it. I think it's a something whole package. Something that's kind of interesting is that uh, in the original conceptions for the music in the game, mm -hmm. um, Tom Francis toyed with the idea when he was having people submit their uh, auditions. And you submitted for that, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, I did. I was like 13 at the time, so I didn't... Mine wasn't very good. Oh, well, fair enough. The point is, mm -hmm. uh, one of his original conceptions was that he wanted to have the music react dynamically mm -hmm. to what happened. So, like, yeah. if you were starting to break a window or uh, be more violent, you know, the action music would kind of bump up and be more upbeat. But I'm, I'm kind of glad that he didn't end up going that direction because it made it feel... Uh, even during the action sequences, it made it feel more serene. Almost, yeah, I agree. Yeah, that would have pushed it more into like Metal Gear territory. Where <laughs> Shout you have, out the Colossus did that. Yeah, where you yeah. have like, but I mean, Metal Gear specifically does this where you're stealthy and it plays the low key music, and right. then if you get spotted, it's that super action mu music, and it gets very tense. Right, and it's supposed to, but this game keeps it relaxed even when you're spotted. So it also kind of helps you not freak out, not feel like, oh, because the game's not an action game. It's not an action game. No. So you shouldn't feel like you're, you're, doing you're action. in action mode. You yeah. should feel, oh, I was I was spotted. I better do something, you know, puzzly to get out of it. Some yeah. sort of, like, trick. Especially since whenever you uh, are doing an action sequence like mm -hmm. that, it lasts two seconds. You know, yeah. you jump on the guy, you land on the ground. <laughs> or or you get shot and you die and you yeah. have to restart. Yeah. So yeah. I, I will say, I do want to share this one experience because I thought it was hilarious. Um, it was one of the earlier levels where there's a whole bunch of um, sky, like sky roofs, like glass mm -hmm. between yeah, each yeah. level. You have to fall between them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so I, uh, I got up to the top and I thought it was really cool that I was... I was Again, trying to beat it in the fastest way possible. So I had it set up so that I, I had the guards like all walking, so they were perfectly lined up, yeah. and then jumped <laughs> onto the glass and fell on all of them. I actually loaded it to make sure that I could get this. I had to try a couple of times. So so I, of I killed all of all the way through and wow. cleared the entire level, and then that was it. I thought that all was like really shot. neat. So that's I like great. that they give you the options to do things like that. Yeah, and I well, think that's one of the strengths of the game. The other thing that's interesting too about that the the music and the tone is that you know even if you go and you shoot someone and like now there's 
there's like a panic in the building and the music mm-hmm. doesn't change. It kind of almost leads to this like interesting thematic thing of, um, uh, I kind of like this cold indifference to the violence mm-hmm. that like, right. this is just part of your yeah. job. It's, it's yeah. no different from opening that door by wirejacking yeah. mm-hmm. or by crosslinking. You, you open the door, you kill the guy. That's step one and two of five to get what you need. Right. Um, well, it's, it's this near future dystopian kind of a feel. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it fits. It fits with all that. Mm-hmm. It's a world where you can buy bullfrog pants and not die. Mm-hmm. Uh, I thought it was interesting too that the I want to live in that world. The, um, too. <laughs> yeah, I'd love, a, I'd love a pair of those. I really would. Not not with the upgrade points, but with the uh, the cash and buying items and new gadgets and stuff like that. It was interesting that you could return anything for the same price you bought yes, it for. Yeah, that was so good. you could basically try it out, see if you like it, and if you find that it doesn't fit, suit your play style, um, you can return it. And it's also interesting that there are a few missions where it required a particular item. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, so well, the cross you, you have to actually buy yeah, Especially the final wire jack. The final yeah, episodes. Yeah. And, and, so, and the item that you take sort of determines how you're going to finish it. Mm-hmm. Like if you take the gun or if you take the, the, the kick down the door ability, mm-hmm. it oh, changes really? the ending. And yeah. I haven't gotten to the ending yet, personally. And, oh, really? No, no, I'm, so, I'm not at the ending. Take the gun. But <laughs> I, I didn't, but you, you, you want to take the gun. That, that's a good design decision, though, I think, because what that does is if you've ever, if you ever force someone to have to have an item to start, if they blew their money on something else and now literally don't have any other missions to go to earn the money to go buy that thing, they're stuck right. and they have to start the game over. So now you can have them return it, get as much money as they need to get that item, go oh, through the mission. Although okay. I wouldn't worry too much. Like, I would, that, that I would was assume, never really an issue. Yeah, I would, I would assume. Well, no, was, that, that's my point, is it's not an issue because they made that design choice. Right. But I know it was not an issue because you can go back never, and do other missions never sold to get back. more money. Yeah, I never need to just sold, yeah. sell anything back. It's, yeah. it's, it's, right it's a safeguard. Had a, lot, a lot of players probably don't even encounter that. It wasn't an issue for me. Uh-huh. But what it does is it makes sure there can't be an issue. Well, I think it matches with the quick reload and some of the other things. It, clearly, Tom Francis has a game philosophy, a designer's philosophy of it is not me versus them. Yeah. And I, I love that philosophy. Give the as much freedom as possible. Yeah, I, mean, right. I know for a fact, Chris, mm-hmm. that you and I share that philosophy. Mm-hmm. Uh, whenever we do our design, it's never the GM versus the player mm-hmm. kind of a thing. But um, I, I think that that's a super important thing. There can be antagonistic elements. The guards can be quote unquote bad guys, but they're not really. I mean, they're just hired guys. They've got, you know, like wife and kids at home that they may never go back to, Jim. I know. Ever. <laughs> um, and well, you're not Jim, innocent either. You killed that guy. Oh, was just nine nine of them. <laughs> they were accidents, and that's different. It's just kind of like, I know, and he has like this big grin on his face. Yeah, I'm like, oh, well. Wow. <laughs> uh, but, but that's my point, is, is that you've got antagonistic elements, but you don't ever feel like the game designers... Uh, we're out to get you. Mm-hmm. And, and those kinds of games where it's me versus you, ha, 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 Mario Maker uh, uploads, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. Or, I, you know, I want to be the guy was the classic right. example. I just hate those kinds of games because it's all about rote memorization yeah. rather than being clever. And, and I think games that challenge you to be clever are so much more strong. Um, and, and I think the design of the game plays into that. And this game is clearly not an, uh, haha, I, I made it hard for the players. Mm-hmm. So if someone goes into this game and goes, the game was too easy, it was stupid, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I can see a lot of people saying that, um, they, they're not the type of player that I think they also, that point is for. I don't think they also found the way to challenge themselves. Right. Because there's so many ways to approach this and so many ways you can pose your own challenges. Right. You can, um, you can play the game super easily if you don't like how Jim's do probably yeah, doing it. just very pragmatic, do whatever you need to, to get through well, it. And it I'm, becomes a lot easier. Yeah. And, and really the, the one, the one sort of like choice that I'm making is speed. I'm trying to get through it quickly mm-hmm. and trying to get through it. Um, so I, I just take the easiest route. So I'm still I still have a challenge to it. Yeah, it's just different from y'all's might be. I don't want to be spotted, or mm-hmm. someone else's yeah. might be. I want to kill everyone. Yeah, it be becomes extremely one. difficult so, if you're not if you're deliberately being silent. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you want to kill no one. Detected. I want to not knock out no one. That's yeah. tricky. That's you're, really you're tricky. making your own fun. Right. Um, and I think the one of the other things this game does that's really great is. Um, they, they take a very cool mechanic and a very cool sort of system overall, and they have just enough levels and just enough variation that you can kind of explore it pretty fully. You don't feel like you're missing anything, mm-hmm. but it also doesn't overstate its welcome. Yeah, it's it's a short enough game that you can get through it, and if you really love it, you can go back and replay and you know keep striving for all these different challenges. Mm-hmm. But you know, by the time I finished my first playthrough, um, last time I played it before we played it again for the roundtable, right? Um, 
I was kind of like, you know what? Cool game. I'm good. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't I didn't feel this strong desire to go back, but I also felt like you know it was a good, satisfying game. So yeah. um, I think that it was just the right length. And regard. it's funny because as much as I uh, have followed this game and and like uh, bought it when it came out and all of that, I had never actually played it to the end to say I had beaten it. And so mm-hmm. I finally got around to beating it the other day, and it took about three hours, start to finish, and a fresh save to just do the thing. Um, and like I said, I, I was trying to do a, a no kill run through, which mm-hmm. was a nice slow methodical one. So I think it was good. Uh, I, I'd like to hear everybody's sort of moment for the game, favorite moment, uh, for the game. You've heard mine. Yeah. <laughs> it was the jumping, jumping through the window, Absolutely. hitting everyone as I, as I fell down. That was just fun. Well, mine, um, is that moment where you have the, the mission to steal the prototype and then the person you've stolen the information from about the prototype contacts you and says, I want to hire you. Mm-hmm. And, and you're like, well, I'm working for the other guy. And, and, and she says, yeah, I know, but there is no prototype. So I want you to oh, go steal one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I then, actually was still reading them at that point. And then, pl- <laughs> and then plant it yeah. and, and pr- will pretend that that's the prototype that you're going to see. And, and so you actually have to do the, this roundabout thing. And I think that's clever because there's a potential here for, oh, look, I'm going into a building and I'm hacking. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, I'm going into a building and I'm hacking. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, I'm going... But if if you actually do kind of get engaged with the plot and the mystery behind the plot of who who's really the killer and who isn't the killer, mm-hmm. and who, who are the bad guys here, um, in in that, you know, who, who am I going to set up yeah, it's very for the fall and take the fall. At the it's, end. it's very noir in that sense it because, is. like you know, even the people you're working for, like they're all kind of like shades of gray, uh-huh. like CEOs of corrupt corporations and stuff like that. Yep. So, um, well, you've got the film fatale. Like, what's her name? Rook. Mm-hmm. She's yeah. essentially the film fatale, right? Right. Um, I think I think my moment for the game was uh, one of the dialogue options in the earlier missions, and this is this is the first time I played it. Um, where you could start uh, telling lies. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I think I know yes. what you're talking about. And uh, it would say, uh, like, you would say something that wasn't true, and then in parentheses at the end it would say lie, like a lot of RPGs mm-hmm. do. Um, and then once you do that three or four times, the person's like, I know that you're lying, and it's not just because you're writing lie in parentheses <laughs> at the end of everything that you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's, like, it's very because, fourth wall because breaking. Well, because they've established, too, that basically these are text messages, and so whatever right. you're clicking on whatever you're typing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're so, literally typing lie yeah. in the parentheses uh, at the end. Of they, they do that a few times, actually, like when you're talking to the police chief and you hand over either the real data or the fake data, yeah. uh, and it says, like, real data in parentheses. Yeah, it's, it's like, like no, you I, didn't have I to trust tell you. You, you don't have data. to tell you it's the... Well, it's like, I trust you. You don't have to tell me it's the real data. It's like, because you type out, like, give him the data, real data, in yeah. parentheses. That's funny. <laughs> uh, well, I know that first time that the cop comes along, he's anonymous. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. so I actually said, like, who are you? And he goes, I'm the chief of police. Mm-hmm. Wait, you want me to hire, <laughs> you want to hire me to, to he's basically investigate, investigate your own guys? Stuff, so and and he starts just suspicious. spilling his guts about how he doesn't trust his own men. It's, yeah. just, it's so wild. <laughs> But, uh, Please don't jump on my men and punch them in the face fifty times. Yeah, is that I, part of the conversation? Well, yeah. Well, one of his requests <laughs> is no violence. Yeah, and and that's a side mission. But then you can actually go in and then kill a bunch of cops, and he doesn't get mad at you. It's a little, it's a little strange. It's occupational hazard. Yeah, very odd. They just fell out of windows. He also doesn't give you a bonus for completing the job if you kill the cops. Now so. that's true. That is a good point. Uh, for but, me, it's hard to pick a favorite moment, but I think my my favorite thing that I've done in the game in general um, is working with the um, the gun jack uh, gadget, mm-hmm. the one where if you, they fire a gun, something triggers, yes. or you can trigger something else to fire the gun. Now, I didn't understand um, how batteries work properly, so I didn't quite get that working at uh, first. Gotcha, yeah. I had to actually sell some stuff back towards mm. the end of the game and, and get my batteries up where they're supposed to be. And then yeah. I had fun with it. Yeah. So I need to go back and get that earlier and play with mm. it. But yeah, well, once I, you know how the game works, replaying it is a lot more fun. That makes sense. I felt like that was one of the more fun gadgets to play with because you know, you're always thinking about, okay, I need to like get to this guy before he can shoot me. But in that case, sometimes you can you have it be like, shoot, yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, go ahead and pull the trigger. And then like when they pull the trigger, the thing you want it to happen happens. It's like, yes. Surprise himself. <laughs> I use yeah. that one a lot. The door, yeah. All kills play through. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, any uh, sort of the final thoughts on Gunpoint before we wrap it up? Just that I'm really excited about Tom Francis's next project, whatever that might be. Heat Signature. Really? Yeah. yeah. We've talked about it a little bit before, actually. I actually uh, played the beta a little bit. Did you? Sweet. Okay. Yep. I knew nothing about it, so... Mm. I talked about it on the podcast one time. I don't listen to the things you say on the podcast. <laughs> I, don't, I don't listen to the things I say on the podcast. What are you talking Fair about? Enough. So sometimes on the podcast, it's like you kind of say a thing, you put it out there, and you know that you don't need to remember it because you can just go listen to the podcast. That's yeah. right. That's exactly right. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, I edit the thing, so I, I hear it at least twice. <laughs> I figure I'm going to catch it whenever you know I go back in and, and, and do mm-hmm. the numeration. So there you go. There you go. Yeah, I, I will say I did, in, I did enjoy the game. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's like one of my favorite games, but I enjoyed playing through it. Mm-hmm. Um, or at least as far as I have gotten so far, I'll probably end up beating it. Worth 10 bucks? Oh, yeah. That's our yeah. new rating system, by the way, Nick. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, how, how many, many dollars would you pay for it? It's, it's, a, it's a 9 out of uh, 100. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> you know, it, it costs $10, and you know, I'm, I'm satisfied with paying that much. I certainly... I actually paid the full $20 for the, the bonus 20? edition and everything, okay. too. Oh, wow. What, what does that include? That includes soundtrack. the soundtrack. It also includes the prototype versions of the game and a 40-minute uh, making of video. And then I believe, I think there's a few other things that it comes with. But basically, you can get two little bonus packets, and they're each $5. Hmm. Yeah. And they're on Steam, so if you want to go grab them, they're still available. As with so many other games that I play, I found that I was in a mood to play Gunpoint, mm-hmm. and then I wasn't in a mood to play Gunpoint. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I'd actually turn it on and be like, okay, cool, let me play some Gunpoint. I'm just not in the mood. So mm-hmm. there's sometimes where I kind of had to force myself through it. I remember the first time I played it, I was more into it because it was fresh and it was new. Um, and there also wasn't a time pressure of getting it done before the round table. Um, so the second time through, I was, I was a little bit more off and on. But um, when I did find myself in the mood and... Um, would play it because you know it's a really solid game i enjoyed it so i had a similar problem whenever i tried to play it a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and it was back in my uh let's play days mm-hmm. i actually you know did lots of filming especially in minecraft mm-hmm. and I, I, just, I actually recorded a couple of hours of myself playing it i went back to edit it to put it up and it was just awful it was mm-hmm. just terrible so mm-hmm. I, I think part of the reason behind that on this one is because it is basically a puzzler and so there's a lot of thinking involved mm-hmm. and sometimes what you're in the mood for is more just action uh or something else and not really so much to do puzzle solving. It doesn't strike me as a game that would be good for Let's Plays. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is fine with me. Uh, well, actually, I could, I could see... I mean, it depend on the audience. I could see it being an interesting Let's Play sort of game in the sense that you can have someone talking you through um, what their thinking is. Like, uh, okay, so I'm going to... Because I'm doing this run, you know, I'm going to try to... You know, here's my strategy, here's my plan, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyway. The only Let's Play channel I watch is Game Rooms, so... Yeah. <laughs> But you're not you're not uh, you're not on Twitch. You don't got the Twitch itch. I don't have the Twitch itch. <laughs> oh, that sounds like you need to get that looked at. Yeah. <laughs> you have the I, 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 actually, I don't have the yeah. Twitch itch. There's, I, I think there's I, a cream for that. Well, there's. I think one of the symptoms is the uh, the inane Twitch uh, chat that happens. Uh, if you've ever seen Twitch chat, don't see Twitch chat. <laughs> <laughs> like it, it gives YouTube comments a run for its money. <laughs> it, first time because I don't. I'm not really on Twitch that much. Um, I've actually seen it more at parties to be honest with you but um whenever i see it it reminds me of the old baron's chat from yeah. World of warcraft <laughs> this where is, this is inane conversations that have nothing to do like like worse worse horrible YouTube stuff this, sure. this is yeah. nothing against people on twitch there's some really great twitch streamers out there but no that, i'm I'm, uh. I'm calling people out on twitch right now <laughs> people not everyone Everyone. I'm calling everyone. Every, <laughs> every single person. Jim hates <laughs> including the, myself. The staff at Twitch, Twitch, the developers at Twitch, everybody who's ever streamed, watched, or commented anything on Twitch. So I'm calling myself out, too. Jim I'm hates everyone. everything involving Twitch. Wow. Wow. Well, that, that seems like a good note to end on. <laughs> so, thank you, everyone, for joining us for episode 73 yeah, of The Backward. You can send you can send the hate mail straight to me. Episode 73 of the backward com podcast, our roundtable on Gunpoint. I'm Chris. I'm Jim. I'm Todd. I'm Nick. And we'll see you next time. We want to join your discussion because dialogue makes everyone better. Want to hear our thoughts on a particular game or topic? Get in touch with us on Facebook, Twitter, SoundCloud, YouTube, or at our website, backward-compatible.com. And we might feature your question on a future episode of the podcast. Thanks for listening. Until next time, stay compatible. Backward compatible.